Good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to this uh, sixth module of training uh, of the RACE project. Uh, and <clears throat> we are going to talk about funding instruments for projects on vulnerable groups. Uh, because uh, all the arrows are involved in uh, uh, deploying uh, uh, the, the so-called ties, the strategies for inclusion, so um, I am going to illustrate a number of programs which uh, have or will support projects on vulnerable groups. Uh, as we will see, some of these projects are now um, going to finish and the new edition will start. So we're going to look at Horizon 2020, which uh, runs over in uh, less than two weeks on the 31st of December is the end of Horizon 2020, and it will be replaced by uh, Horizon Europe. We're going to look at the Erasmus Plus, which has the same dynamics. It will finish this year and the new edition will start next year. In Erasmus Plus, we're going to look at two different types of projects, the strategic partnerships and the capacity building for higher education. We're going to look uh, uh, at the uh, Asylum Migration and Integration Fund. Uh, we are going to look at Europage. All of these programs are run by the European Union, the European Commission. Uh, we are going to uh, have a very quick glance to the Union for Mediterranean, which is a different institution. Uh, it is a, uh, an association of uh, uh, 41 member states, among which also the European Union uh, as an additional partner. And then I will give you just a few examples of local programs. A few examples because local programs, by definition, are specific to the location where you are. So. I'm not in a position to know uh, what kind of local programs you have in Finland, uh, in Turkey, uh, or in Jordan. This is for you to search. I'll give you some examples of what we have in Italy, just to give you a flavor. And then we have to have short conclusions and recaps. Now, I would like to keep this session uh, as interactive as possible. So may, apart from Horizon 2020, which is obvious because RACE is an H 2020, I would like to know how many of you have already experience have experience in in these in these uh in some of these programs or in which ones please take your frock and speak uh, we just go yeah yeah go uh myself uh i'm curious about the union for the mediterranean which i don't know about and I have no experience thus. Okay. Uh, the others I'm quite familiar. Okay, so you can help me in the teaching. <laughs> <laughs> okay, our Turkish colleagues. Uh, Raniero, I can tell you that um, I am uh, curious on uh, Erasmus plus strategic partnerships and at the same time capacity building for higher education. and. Anyway. Let's go on. So the, the objectives of, of this uh, short uh, seminar is to give you an overall view of some uh, European Union and international programs addressing vulnerable groups issues. Now, I have to say from the terminology point of view that we uh, include uh, many categories, the broadest sense, refugees, asylum seekers, migrants, possibly displayed people and so on and so forth. Uh, in whenever possible, we will provide information not only on the program itself, but also provide some examples of real projects because this gives you a flavor of what can be done and what cannot be done. Uh, and of course, because we have uh, several countries around the table, we will give particular attention to analyzing uh, which eligible country, which countries can participate in which. So we start with uh, Horizon 2020. It's the European Framework Program for Research and Innovation. I have to say that the main focus of Horizon 2020, as all the framework programs, has been on, on research and innovation in science and technology, but uh, there, is, uh, there was a one specific section addressing socioeconomic research and innovation. It was called Societal Challenge 6, Europe in a Changing World. 
inclusive, innovative, and reflective societies. And this uh, is not uh, very clear to, uh, it's not a very clear name, you must know it, but what I've done, I've copied here some of the uh, topics which could be addressed, uh, which, are, which are part of the work program. For instance, uh, uh, there is a, a big block on migrations. There is the understanding migration mobility patterns, elaborating mid and long-term migration scenarios. As you can see, it's very, very, very ambitious. Uh, number two was towards forward-looking migration governance, addressing challenges, assessing capacities, and designing future strategies. And I put in bold migration 08, addressing the, the challenge of force, forced displacement. Can anybody tell me why I have put this one in bold? Does it ring a bell to you? It's ours. It's yours. <laughs> ours, yes. This is the, uh, the call on which uh, we all uh, responded and we got uh, the project. So as you can see, uh, there, is a, there is a broad range of, of topics. Uh, you have to remember that these are research and innovation projects. So it's not about, you know, uh, simply deploying, uh, for instance, inclusion schemes, etc. But there is a big uh, um, research, research and innovation component, uh, as it is in, in the raised project. Now, talking about participation, in all these calls, the participation of non-European countries or non-European Union countries was eligible. Uh, there are, there, I have to say that uh, uh, in terms of Horizon 2020, there are three main blocks of countries. There are uh, the uh, EU uh, member states, which are 27 at the moment, which are of course always and by definition eligible. There are uh, countries which are so-called pre-accession or accession countries, and for instance, Turkey is in the accession states, and all of these uh, these countries are called associated uh, countries, and they can participate. And there are the other countries like Jordan or Lebanon, which are not uh, in any of these states. But if you can justify that their pres their presence is needed for carrying out the the project, then they are. Um, <clears throat> They are allowable countries. Uh, so on a case-by-case -case basis, you must analyze very, very careful which are the eligible countries and which are not. Uh, the H2020 program is, as I said, is going to, uh, to be terminated uh, on the 31st of December, which is uh, 10 days from now. The definition of its successor, which is called Horizon Europe, is uh, uh, very much advanced. It will have a similar structure, but with some differences. What they normally say is evolution, not revolution. What the commission says is that, yes, we're going to, to deliver a new program. Uh, we were, we're going to evolve it, to change it, but it's, no, it's never gonna be a real revolution. So it will be basically the same, uh, the same structure uh, with some, some modifications, some evolutions. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have uh, details, specific details about what uh, social economic research and international activities will become within uh, the H2020 program. We have seen declarations by the European Commission that these, uh, these topics, these themes will be, of course, addressed uh, uh, as a continuity with respect to the current program to H2020, but we don't have the details. But I'm pretty sure that uh, there will be a significant section about socioeconomic research, so it won't be only uh, uh, science and technology, and of course international activities will be included. Uh, I don't know if it is clear for everybody, uh, in the uh, Euro European Union jargon, uh, the term international has a very specific meaning. Uh, International means uh, projects, international activities are activities where you can involve countries which are not part of the European Union. If you set up a project uh, which is only made up like in the strategic partnerships, which are 
constituted uniquely by uh, European Union members, they call it transnational. So when you see transnational, it means countries which belong to the European Union. International means that they involve countries which are not part of the European Union. And of course, uh, the example of H2020 uh, that we all know we, have, we all have is the RAISED project. So I won't spend any more time on this. So we are, we are waiting to see the new uh, work programs for uh, Horizon Europe for the next generation. It is due to start on the 1st of January. Uh, there might be uh, probably some delays due to the the COVID uh, and you also to some tensions which have uh, <coughs> been created in the uh, uh, formulation of the budget recommendations. But I think that we are getting there and that it will start in, uh, uh, in the next few months. The other big program uh, that we have all been dealing with is Erasmus Plus. Erasmus Plus <coughs> Uh, had the same time frame as Horizon 2020, 2014-2020, and it is the EU program, the European program, which supports education, training, youth, and sports in Europe. And uh, as as a difference from uh, uh, from Horizon 2020, it has some specific programs which are very very much differentiated between each other. In Horizon 2020. What changes very much is the topic of the program, the sub-programs. Here, it's also this, the structure, the terminology, everything. So uh, <clears throat> we will only focus on two of them. There is one uh, in key action one. Key action one of Erasmus uh, Plus was dedicated to mobility. So in this case, you, you, you shouldn't, you wouldn't submit the real project development projects. It was basically about mobility of students, of uh, teachers, of teaching staff, etc. So, uh, as I was saying, in K Action One, you have a lot of, uh, uh, let's say, funding for mobility projects. Uh, but the two uh, sub programs that we are going to look at, the two uh, project types that we are going to look at are strategic partnerships and capacity building for higher education. Now, strategic partnerships support innovation in the sector of education and training, as well as joint initiatives to promote cooperation, peer learning, and the sharing of experiences. They are normally open to only uh, European Union countries. The participation of non-European countries is eligible in some very specific case. And UNIMED, uh, because we are a, uh, uh, an association of universities, we have done a number of strategic partnerships, and the real specialist here is Christina. I, I've, I've listed here two projects, the in, which, which are obviously related with the theme of vulnerable groups, uh, the in here projects and the in university. In here uh, is finished uh, some time ago, uh, whereas university is an ongoing project. So, Christina, uh, the, the floor is yours. I will go through the, through the slides. Thank you, Reniera. Thank you so much. And thanks for doing this page down thing as well. So, would you like to say, before we start, a couple of words about this issue of which countries can participate in strategic partnership and which not? Thank you. Go ahead. Uh, sorry, you want me to say something about which are the countries? Yes, please do. Can participate. Yeah, please. Um, well, strategic strategic partnership projects uh, are field specific. So, um, strategic partnership can be in the field of school, vocational training, higher education, and youth. It is also possible to have projects um, targeting more than one um, field. Strategic partnerships are open to the world. So any uh, organization from any country can participate with the aim to achieve, in, in the case of um, projects in the field of higher education, uh, with the aim to achieve the objectives of the European education area. So um, 
any organization which can bring an added value to the European strategic partnerships in achieving the aims of the European higher education area are eligible to participate. So this is in general terms, but in, in, in the reality, in the practice of those projects, um, organizations which are not from the European member states um, should bring an added value which is not um, achievable, let's say, among the European-based uh, organizations. I don't know if this is yeah. what you wanted me to say about the uh, composition of the partnership, Raniero. Okay, thank you. Okay, go on, go on, go on with the project. Thank you. So I will present two examples of two strategic partnership projects in the field of higher education that we have been implementing. Uh, one is the IN HERE project, which, which stands for um, Higher Education Supporting Refugees in Europe. Um, strategic partnership projects are managed by um, national Erasmus Plus agencies. So this project has been managed by the Italian National Agency. And in the next slide, you can see a little bit about the objectives and uh, um, the outcomes that we have produced within the project. So this project started during the 2015 refugee crisis as a way to bring together different um, organizations in Europe um, to respond to the crisis, um, strengthening knowledge sharing, peer support and academic partnership to facilitate um, the integration and access of refugee and people in refugee-like situations in the European higher education area. Uh, this project has been coordinated by UNIMED in a consortium composed by Sapienza University, the University of Barcelona, uh, Campus France, and the European University Association. And UNHCR has been an associated partner. So we have produced four main outputs as a project, as structure around uh, um, intellectual outputs. A good practice catalog, a living lab, guidelines for universities, and recommendations for the policy level. So in the next slide, there are a few details about uh, the first uh, of the intellectual outputs which have been produced within the project and the good practice catalog. So it's a catalog of initiatives of universities throughout Europe um, who have been active in starting and implementing initiatives for the inclusion of refugees into higher education. So we have analyzed more than 300 practices since at that time, many universities were starting new initiatives and um, yeah, new actions within or without an institutional strategy. And we have categorized those actions into a number of um, categories. So initiatives which facilitate the, recogn the recognition of credits and qualification, uh, initiatives to facilitate the access to higher education, financial support, language and bridging courses, integration measures, um, et cetera. And this is the first main output of the project, which you can uh, consult on the project website. And next slide, Raniero, thank you so much. I'm so sorry. I, I think I'm not able to do the page down from here. Right? Uh, based on this analysis, um, we have designed guidelines uh, for universities to welcome um, refugees in higher education. The aim of those guidelines is to provide um, a practical guideline for universities to start or implement uh, new initiatives to inspire commitment and to raise stakeholder awareness. The guidelines are structured in three categories, access, integration, and strategic planning. Uh, next slide. Uh, within those activities, uh, we have also organized a summer school, a staff, um, a staff week, staff training week in Rome at Sapienza University. 
And this is just to mention that among the activities that you can organize within strategic partnership projects, there are also those uh, short term joint staff trainings, which are intended to be um, short term trainings targeted to the staff working within uh, the partner organizations. And in this case, we have taken the opportunity of this training to enlarge the participation to other uh, universities throughout out Europe who have been um, participating in this initiative through other type of mobility grants given by the national agencies in the different European countries. And this is just a picture of the team and a message uh, that we have been writing together for um, yeah, raising awareness on, on the topic of the, of the project. Um, and the last uh, output has been a set of recommendations to um, policy makers and decision makers for enhancing the access of refugees into higher education. I think there is another slide at the end where I've listed uh, the, um, the next one, where I've listed the other activities that we have organized, which are eligible for such projects, which are the so-called multiplier events. So we have organized a number of multiplier events, which are intended to be events where the partnership um, can multiply the message and the results of the project to other organizations and universities in the countries or in other countries. So we have organized a number of those type of activities um, from awareness raising events, um, the training course that I mentioned before, a policy dialogue which has been useful for the setup of the recommendations and the final event uh, in Brussels. This is a few words about this project. There are also the contact details at the end. So based on the result of this project, and in particular based on the, um, on the good practice analysis, what we, ha what we have understood, which is pretty simple, is that the initiatives which are more sustainable within the organizations are those initiatives for the integration of refugees and migrants which are linked to a diversity and overarching diversity strategy within the university. Uh, so with more or less the same partnership, um, we, we tried to move from the in here project, which was focused on supporting higher education institution to welcome refugees um, we're, we're trying to, to move from, from this type of action to an action focused on supporting the universities towards an, the setup and the design definition of institutional uh, strategies for the integration of refugees and migrants and for all the challenges related to migrants and migrations within the universities. So this is the Unidiversity Project. Uh, which started in uh, December last year. And this is a 24 month project uh, coordinated by Sapienza University and Unimed is, um, is a partner uh, together the, uh, with the University of Barcelona and the European University Association. And this time Campus France and IOM uh, are associated partners. Um, the objectives of uh, Unidiversity are to increase knowledge about uh, transferable uh, initiatives and strategies and approaches towards diversities which are implemented by uh, the universities and are related to migration. To inspire commitment of universities in uh, starting and uh, addressing societal challenges related to migration raise awareness among the European academic community, empower higher education institutions in developing their own um, overarching diversity strategy within the university, and mainstream practices in a comprehensive framework for action that would support the European higher education institution strategic planning in, in this domain across uh, Europe. There are four outputs in the next slide for this project. 
an analytic atlas, which is still a good practice analysis with a focus on um, institutional strategies linked to issues related to migration, and a campaign, an awareness campaign that we will do um, through social media and other means um, to foster a dialogue related to the to the issues of migration and against, let's say, the toxic narratives about migrants and migration that we see um, in Europe in those times. We will produce a toolkit for universities to design their own um, strategies, institutional strategies, and a strategic framework for social responsible universities in the era of migration. Um, these are examples of activities and type of outputs that you can do uh, within those type of strategic partnership projects. And um, here are the links to the project websites where you can have more, more information. Thank you. And if you have any questions, happy to talk about that. Thank you, Christina. And uh, yes, if, you, if anybody has uh, questions about that, Please, please go ahead and, and ask Christina. Now we will, of course, upload this uh, presentation also to the website, so you will have all the references. Uh, can I ask a question to Christina? Yes, of course. Yes, please. Thank you, Christina, and thank you once again, Raniero. Um, I'm a member of Anadolu University in Turkey, and I was wondering uh, in terms of uh, the capability and the student size of the university because of its open education system, as far as I, I know, it's the world's second biggest open education system with more than a million students. And historically, we had two and a half million students up most at certain period of time. So I do remember that some point in the past rector's time that we wanted to provide open education system to refugees. And actually, it was it was initiated by the uh, former Portuguese uh, president. I cannot remember his name, but it was a higher education system for refugees. So, but unfortunately, in Tur in countries like Turkey, uh, when rectors get changed, so things get changed. <laughs> but at this very current moment, the rector we have. He is very positive about the refugee issues and very sensitive. So my, actually, I have a two layered question. One of them is, and actually he really supports our race project, by the way. He was so happy to hear that we have this project. So one question is how we can, or if we can become a member of this uh, project, somehow even as associates, or maybe we can think of things how we can actually relate our open education system into this. Because imagine in every city of the country, our university has offices with some uh, uh, units that can provide equipment, computers to students. But I mean, it has offices in every city. And in cities like Istanbul, Izmir, multiple offices, I mean, service centers. So I was thinking, if we can be a partner of this. Uh, well, alliance. definitely, I think that we would have an interest in understanding um, yeah, the institutional strategy behind this initiative of providing open educational resources to refugees and migrants, because I think that this has been a strong element driving this huge initiative. So maybe we can discuss this uh, by email or through a, a call in the next days, but I think that it would be interesting to, to, to understand and describe the process and the strategy of, of your university towards those initiatives. Um, well, as you know, those are a small partnership and uh, I mean, it's not, we, we, we cannot formally have more partners or uh, associated partners, but 
um, in all the activities that we do, there is a way for other universities to get involved. At least you can have it in mind. And as you said, we can exchange later on. Yes, definitely, definitely. And this okay. is super interesting also for the open education uh, part, not only for the strategies for inclusion. Um, Nezi, you also mentioned before that you are, um, that you wanted to say something about strategic partnerships and... Uh... Actually, I can say that, I mean, when it comes to evaluation of strategic partnerships, there are very basic uh, questions that when it comes to uh, assessing the projects, I can tell you easily that what they are, uh, those five eight issues. <coughs> I mean, for any anyone who may, who's dealing with project, it's one thing, it's they're looking for relevance of the project, relevance of the strategy. Second one is the quality of the project design and quality of the project implementation. Third one is the quality of the project team and the cooperation arrangements. And the last one, they're looking for impact and dissemination besides those overall you know, project areas that issues of assessment. Very, very general, that's I just wanted to share immediately. Excellent, yeah, very important to mention. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, thank you very much, Christina, for this uh, presentation. <clears throat> and of course, um, we are, sorry, uh, I'm going back. Can you see the slides now? Yeah. Okay. So thank you very much, Christina, for the, the presentation of these two these two projects. And uh, of course, uh, if, if there are uh, some interaction, possible interactions uh, with uh, with any of the members, you are you are highly uh, <coughs> welcome to do so. Uh, by the way, I forgot to say that actually, the main role of of, of Christina in our in Unimed is that she's really the expert about open education, uh, open education resources, OERs, etc. She was the one who created the link with Fauzi Baroud, who has delivered uh, this series of, of webinars about uh, OERs. So uh, the, 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 if you want to discuss issues about open education, she is the person to talk to. Erasmus Plus, as I said, uh, is um, composed by a number of sub-programs and uh, uh, the, the other one in which we are very, very, very much involved, as you can imagine, is capacity building for higher education. Uh, it is meant, uh, of course, as the name says, it addresses academic cooperation with non-European Union countries. Uh, Virtually all less industrialized or non-industrialized countries outside the European Union are eligible in our case, are eligible, but of course, in our case, uh, <clears throat> the, the most interesting part for us is uh, in Middle East and North, North African countries, which are eligible. Uh, it has several priorities, vertical and national priorities, but one of them is called a cross-cutting priority, and it addresses the integration in higher education of refugees from conflict-affected countries. And on this, this priority, we submitted, and we were lucky it was obtained. It was approved, uh, the rescue project. Now, I have to say something about partnership. Uh, Erasmus Plus um, foresees basically two types of countries. Uh, the uh, the program countries and the partner countries. The program countries are basically European Union countries plus Turkey. Turkey under this respect is considered as being uh, a part of the European Union. And then the partner countries are all the countries which are not part of the European Union. So when we look uh, at the rescue project, I will, uh, I will go to the, to the website of the project. So RESCUE stands for Refugee Education Support in MENA country. MENA stands, of course, for, for Middle East and North African countries. So we use this acronym RESCUE, which reminds us uh, that uh, whenever, whenever we have refugees, 
we have to address uh, the problem of, of people who are uh, in a very difficult situation in distress situation. What was the, uh, the main objective of, of the rescue project? is to help the partner country universities in structuring an effective response to the problem of which problem uh, of the refugees from is basically uh, Syrian, but not only Syrian refugees, also uh, Palestinian refugees, or so any kind of forcibly displaced people, uh, people who were going to the university in their home countries and they had to leave to run away to save their lives, and they want to restart. Uh, their academic career. So um, the, the goal of the project is to help the partner country universities uh, in structure an effective response to the problem by creating ad hoc units, which we called Refugee Student Operational Support Unit, RSOS. And here again, the idea of SOS, we try to save people to save their lives. And the mission of these RSOS units is to structure specific services supporting the refugee students in resuming their academic training paths. The analysis which we carried out in these countries shown that each one has different approaches and constraints vis-a-vis -vis this problem. Therefore, a doc solution must be implemented in each one of them. We realized very quickly that uh, because the partnership, which I'm going to show you the partnership, so the partnership was constituted on the European side by UNIMED, which was the coordinator, Sapienza University, Technische Universität Berlin in Germany, and uh, one uh, Turkish university, Istanbul Aydin University, it's a private, a big private university in Istanbul, and uh, University of Barcelona again, which, uh, as you can understand, is uh, one of our uh, uh, historical partners. Then we had the three uh, universities in Lebanon the uh, Holy Spirit University of Kaslik in Lebanon, uh, the Lebanese University, which is the only uh, public university in, uh, in Lebanon, and uh, LIU, Lebanese International University, which by the way is also a partner of the RAIDS project. Then we had two universities in Northern Iraq or Kurdistan, uh, the University of Dohok and uh, the Polytechnic University of Dohok. And then we had three uh, Jordanian universities, uh, Yarmouk University, which, by the way, is a partner of the RAISE project, uh, Azaytuna University, and Zarka University. And in addition to that, we had uh, the Arab Association, uh, the Association of Arab Universities, ARO, in, in, in Jordan, which is a very, very big uh, organization of uh, over 300, 300 members. Uh, <clears throat> so among the project results, uh, apart from setting up the um, no, this is not what I want to sh say. I wanted to show you the. Um, we also did uh, a very very big, um, very important effort in um, setting up um, uh, how do you say best practices. We have a, a best practice repository, which now at the moment I can't find, but uh, I can I can assure you it's it's there. Uh, the uh, um, oh, I'm sorry, it, it has disappeared. But uh, I will send you if you are interested. Uh, I will send you the link. It is a uh, an important uh, piece of, of 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 knowledge. We have um, an extensive uh, best practice. Uh, collection about best practice about, uh, about what about how uh, both Euro uh, uh, European and um, Arab universities have set up uh, response to uh, the problem of the uh, refugees crisis. So the project was uh, ended in uh, October uh, to, uh, 200, 2019, about one year ago. We uh, and we have put in place eight RSOS unit in each one of these eight universities. And I'm very, very proud to say that <clears throat> after one year, uh, they are all still operat operational and, uh, and working up and running. <clears throat> they, what do they do? They provide support to students 
belong to, belonging to disadvantaged groups in accessing higher education. They provide information, they provide orientation, they provide support in finding scholarship, and they also provide a basic set of training courses on languages, on uh, information technologies, and these kind of things. Uh, I want to uh, attract your attention to the fact that I am I, I use here the wording uh, disadvantaged groups. Why? Because at the beginning we had thought that the project should address refugees, uh, but we very quickly realized. Mm -hmm. Sorry, <clears throat> that um, this was a problem in some of the countries, especially in the countries where uh, they have a very, very high number of refugees. As you know, in Jordan, they have like 35% of the people are refugees, in Lebanon the same, and in, uh, in Kurdistan it's even higher, it's about 50%. And if you see that, if you show that you are providing services only to refugees, then the local people uh, will get uh, in some way irritated and will say, why, why are we supporting these people coming up from outside and not the people coming from our own countries. Huh? In Italy, we have a, uh, uh, let's say, a sovereignist uh, uh, a movement which says Italians first. Okay, in Lebanon, you have those who, who say Lebanese first, uh, Jordanians first, and so on and so forth. So uh, we opened it up. The, the local university decided to open up these services also to local people uh, belonging to uh, disadvantaged groups. This is to say that whenever you uh, you set up this kind of services, uh, you should be very, very careful and not to show that you're only pri giving privilege to coming to people coming from outside because you could have some problems in, in that. So capacity building for higher education is probably the program where we have the highest number of running projects because it is about uh, inter-university uh, cooperation with the Mediterranean countries. Uh, as in, in the previous case, as in, in the case of uh, Horizon 2020, also Erasmus Plus programs come to an end at the, at, the, at the end of this month, and the next edition is in preparation. Again, under the claim evolution, not revolution. So we don't have very specific indication of how it will be structured. We have seen uh, generic statements that <clears throat> it will be uh, probably uh, the, the procedures will be simplified, uh, the uh, topics will be broadened and so on and so forth. Uh, and, uh, but one of the, um, the indications that we have, uh, we have seen is that the support to international activities, which I remind you means involving countries not belonging to the European Union will be strengthened and widened. Now, if Christina or Nezi have some more information about the next generation of Erasmus Plus, uh, please, please uh, provide this information and share this information with the members. Um, yeah. I can. Uh, I have to tell you that especially they recently announced, and actually they immediate they recently had the call called KA226 because of the COVID-19, uh, they kind of uh, started, uh, came up with a call, uh, putting everything on the digital world. So it was the uh, strategic cooperation ships for the digital world. So we recently received uh, applications and actually we finished the first round. So apparently because of the COVID-19 process, most parts and especially the title called KA226 will be really focusing on how we can evolve in the digital world, or how things can be carried out to the digital world in terms of strategic uh, partnerships. Yes, Nancy, we are well, very well aware of that. And I think Christina has written three or four proposals under this specific call. <laughs> Uh, but this was still part of, uh, of the current uh, uh, version of Erasmus+. Plus. Uh, my question is whether you have information about the next uh, generation no. of, of Erasmus+. Plus. Christina, do you know anything about that? No, no. We are all waiting. 
we are waiting. Yeah. yeah. Uh, <clears throat> as I said, I have seen a presentation by the European Commission saying very generic statements like we are going to simplify the procedures, wow. we are going to broaden the scope, we are going. But the budget uh, is approved. That's the most important thing. The budget is uh, approved. The budget is, I think, uh, doubled, no? Something like that. It's about 30 billion. Something like that. And it's, I think, one of the very first things they agreed on it. So actually, they're very happy with Erasmus. Yeah, of course. Yeah, because, because in Erasmus Plus, in, uh, in Horizon 2020, they tried to increase the budget to 100 million by the billion, but I don't think they managed. I think the, the final score is, is 80, 80 billion, exactly the same as, as Horizon 2020. Whereas in this case, yes, they have doubled. So it, th these are good news. Uh, and, uh, uh, and also, as I said, the support for international activities will be widened. For instance, if I'm not wrong, I've read that the new version of uh, capacity building will not only address higher education, but also vocational educational training. So it should be possible to set up similar projects, similar instructor, but addressing more vocational educational training and not only the uh, academic, academic cooperation. Anyway, we will see. Uh, and I'm pretty sure that the capacity building, however, the capacity building for higher education will be maintained. So uh, this is an area, of course, these are not research projects. These are projects where you have to uh, sort of strengthen the cooperation, strengthen the governance of partner universities, create one very one of the most uh, common cases is where you set up new master courses, for instance, on specific topics which can be of interest for the for the country. So it is uh, for 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 academic institutions which are interested in international cooperation. This is definitely a good a good um, a good opportunity. By 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 the way. Uh, as I've, seen, as I've shown in the rescue in, in the rescue project, uh, the participation is not limited only to academic institutions. For instance, in rescue, there were two organizations which were not higher education institution. One is UNIMED, which was the coordinator. We are not a university; we are an association of university. And the second one was ARO, which is an association of uh, Arab universities. And so, I'm, for instance, I'm talking to Luisa. Uh, there is room for NGOs, for uh, civil society organizations, for all kinds of organizations which are not academic, provided it is clear what kind of contribution they can give to the, uh, to the project. So far, uh, so in, my, in my understanding, just to say the few things I've understood about the novelties in the program, are that for the key action one mobilities, uh, there would be mobility of school pupils, which is something new uh, for the program, and language learning opportunities as, as well. And those language learning opportunities would be increased under the key action one mobility program. And as far as I have, in, I have understood in the key action two, there would be partnership for cooperation and those partnership for cooperation, which includes the capacity building projects, um, they will include also small scale partnerships for those organizations which are new to the program. Uh, there will be partnership for excellence for, as an example, European universities, the centers for vocational excellence and uh, joint master degrees and partnership for innovation, which is very similar to the strategic partnership. And, and for the key action three um, policy, um, the only thing that I have understood at, <clears throat> is that there will be uh, increased cooperation with other European instruments and support for other policy areas for, for policy development under the key action three. But yeah, we are all still waiting for the program. Indeed. Thank you. Thank you very much, Christina, for this. Uh complementary information, but the big question is when is it going to start? Because we are all keen to, you know, in UNIMED, normally this period of, of the year uh, used to be a hectic one because normally the deadline for capacity building for higher education was at the beginning of February. 
So at this very time, we normally had uh, like three or four proposals where we were, which we were coordinating the writing and we were partners in other 10 or, or 15 other projects, uh, proposals. But this year it, it's very calm and, uh, uh, and, and, and in a way we are sorry for that. Now, uh, we've seen Horizon 2020, we've seen Erasmus Plus. Uh, the third program, which is, uh, I think, particularly suited to the environment where we are moving, is, is called the MF, Pro the MF, which stands for Asylum Migration and, and Integration Fund. Uh, it is a, a program uh, which, as all the other ones, publishes uh, specific cost proposals. Its general objective is to contribute to the efficient management of migration flows and to the implementation, strengthening and development of the common policy on asylum, subsidiary protection and temporary protection and the common immigration policy, while fully respecting the rights and principles enshrined in the Charter of Fundamental Rights of the European Union. Um, as I said, it works also through calls for proposals. Uh, there is one uh, open now, but it, uh, it closes in a, few, in a few weeks. I just give you some titles just to give you a flavor of, of the kind of, uh, these are closed, uh, uh, recently closed. Awareness raising and information campaigns on the risk of irregular migration in selected third countries and within Europe. This is one case where uh, it was possible to involve countries which didn't belong to uh, the European Union. Foster integration of persons in need of protection through private sponsor sponsorship schemes, uh, support to the victims of trafficking in human beings, social economic integration of migrant women, and so on and so forth. So you see protection of children and migration, the classical themes, the classical topics, of uh, integration uh, for for uh, for refugees, for asylum seekers, and people and people like that. And under this scheme, uh, sorry, Oof. Uh, there was um, the previous call. Uh, transnational ac actions on asylum, migration, and integration. We were a partner, we are partner of a project called SAFE, which means foster cooperation for improving access to protection. Uh, the, the, the aim of the project is uh, to foster the collaboration at a transnational level between stakeholders in order to develop and improve uh, access to protection through private sponsorship schemes. Private sponsorship schemes are a particular type of scheme where, uh, as, as the name says, private institutions provide funding uh, for, uh, to support the integration of, of migrants uh, for the beneficiaries of international protection. Now here, one thing which uh, Christina didn't say is that in the In Here project, they have produced a series of webinars which I think they are still available, aren't they? About some topics uh, uh, relevant to the integration of refugees. And for instance, I attended one which I found very interesting about uh, the, the, the status of refugees. What does it mean to be, to have the formal status of a refugee, uh, the Geneva Convention and things like that. So this is something that I, we will link uh, to our uh, platform so that those who want to, to attend the, 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 the seminars, they can do so. Uh, but again, we are uh, in the area of uh, international protection. So what are the expected results? The establishment of an effective transnational cooperation at European level between actors implementing private sponsorship schemes, a better understanding of operating procedures by stakeholders, the involvement of non-special actors in the PSS and the experimentation of new schemes, a better integration of the beneficiary of uh, private um, sponsorship schemes for the integration. Uh, the part, this is the partnership. It is led by Forum Refugié Cosi in France, which is an NGO dealing with, as the name says, with refugees. Uh, we have the Federation of Protestant uh, Helpers in France. Uh, the Federation of Evangelic uh, Churches in Italy, the Red Cross in Italy, Oxfam Italia, 
which is the Italian branch of, of Oxfam, which is one of the most famous NGOs operating in the area of international cooperation. Then there is UNIMED, uh, there is the French Red Cross, and uh, we have a Canadian partner, Intercultural Association of Greater Victoria, because as you probably know, Canada is also a country which is very, very much involved uh, in, in uh, protection. Uh, so uh, he, here is again the list uh, of uh, expected results. So basically we want to, um, to strengthen the transnational cooperation, uh, but most importantly, experimentation on new schemes on how to uh, put together uh, private sponsorships uh, to, in order to implement uh, protection schemes. And of course, a better integration of the beneficiaries. Uh, what will be the main deliverables? An online platform promoting at international level actors and good practices. Again, good practices and best practices are a theme which always comes back in, uh, <clears throat> uh, in all European projects. A creation of a French platform of resettlement and, and uh, PSS, a design of new community sponsorship program in Italy, mappings of actors in France and in Italy, design of toolboxes. Uh, on uh, private sponsorship scheme and the design of a university corridor. Actually, UNIMED is in charge for the university part. So designing a, U, uh, a new university corridor as a complementary pathway. Do, uh, I don't know how many of you are, are, are familiar with the concept of university corridors and uh, uh, complementary pathways, but these are uh, privileged, let's say, as the name says, corridors from specific uh, origin countries to Europe in order to promote uh the uh, the transfer of students who want to attend the university in uh, in in europe the the the, the fourth program uh, i will very very quickly touch upon because it is a very very wide program uh, is uh, is called europe aid Europe Aid is the european union program supporting cooperation for development international cooperation so we are not talking about uh, research here. We are not talking about academic programs. We are talking about cooperation for development, how to help less developed countries. Uh, it has a, a strong focus, of course, about uh, migration and forced displacement. This is, this is the, the homepage. You see it's called International Cooperation and Development. And um, the themes here are uh, supporting the management of migration. You see what they say, well-managed migration can enhance the development of both the countries of destination and origin and be beneficial for the migrants themselves and their families. There is a big debate in the area of uh, international uh, cooperation as to whether it is a good idea uh, to facilitate migrations versus trying to avoid migrations. There are two schools of thought, I would say. Uh, here the Commission is saying, because migration flows are there, we'd better try and manage them uh, as, as well as we can. So there is a, a number of, um, uh, you see the international community recognizing migration as a core development cooperation in the agenda for the uh, sustainable development goals. Uh, and therefore, the approach to migration is a comprehensive and balanced approach to migration. I don't want to, uh, to go into this uh, detail, but um, the commit, if we talk about forces displacement, the commitment translation into concrete action, uh, early engagement in the most pressing displacement situation around the world, Horn of Africa, Afghanistan, Iran, Pakistan, etc. And they provide uh, assistance uh, the, trying to deal with the root cause of irregular migration and forced displacement, like fostering resilience, stability, and security of the origin countries, helping them to create socioeconomic and job opportunities, especially for young people, etc. I don't want to go into all the details because it is this is this is the policy document. On this basis, they publish uh, exam uh, calls for proposals. Uh, we, will, we are going to look at the titles of some of these. Now, this is an area where uh, universities are normally not the main actors. They are mm, 
I don't know why it is in French. Let's take the English one. Okay, this is the search, uh, the search area for codes for proposals and tenders. For instance, if I select, you see, I have a number of uh, vertical programs. I've taken the one in uh, human rights uh, near and the Middle East. Now, at, the, at the, this very moment, there are not very many. You see, they are only red. There are just a few open. Uh, but I will just will take uh, some some titles. Uh, they they you see they, they address uh, specific countries: Tunisia, Jordan, Israel, uh, near and Middle East, for instance. Here, uh, let's take one. This is uh, concerning with Le Lebanon. Uh, it's uh, called the European Instrument for Dem Democracy and Human Rights. Support local civil society action through uh, country-based support schemes in Lebanon. So this is a typical case. They take one country like Lebanon. Uh, they realize that there is a need to support uh, the civil society organizations in uh, trying to provide, them, for instance, uh, support in, in developing human rights uh, and, uh, and democracy. And they publish a call which is specific for that particular country. Now, what, it, what does it mean? It means that you will, you will need some partners. It's normally reserved to uh, uh, non-profit organizations, uh, including, of course, universities. And you will need to set up a partnership with some European countries and some Lebanese partners uh, to, develop, uh, to develop these uh, uh, this project. Let's see, uh, just as an example, the objectives of this uh, of this program of this call. Now this is over now. Right? It was uh, the deadline was in May last year, but uh, objectives. The specific objective is support actions which seek to support and promote the employment of or the enjoyment of all human rights by LGBTI persons and protect them against dissemination, promotion and protection of the fundamental freedoms of expression and freedom of media. The priority of this call are the rights of LGBTI persons and the freedom of expression and freedom for, uh, of the media, you see. So, uh, and here you have all the data, etc. So it was just to give you an example of uh, what kind of um, programs could be interesting for uh, organizations such as yours, Europe Aid. So in this case, uh, you have to focus on specific countries and from time to time, go to this website and analyze whether there are uh, interesting proposals, uh, calls for proposals or not. Now, the Union for the Mediterranean, what is it? It is an intergovernmental Euro-Mediterranean organization bringing together all countries of the European Union plus 15 countries of the Southern and Eastern Mediterranean. The mission is to enhance the regional cooperation, dialogue and implementation of projects and initiatives which are tangible acts on our citizens with an emphasis on young people and women in order to address the three strategic objectives of the region, stability, human development, and integration. Uh, and uh, it's not says here, but uh, the European Commission is a member of the European, uh, of the Union for Mediterranean, as though they were another country. Uh, the member states are, of course, the 27, uh, countries of the European Union. And then you have these countries here, uh, Albania, Algeria, Bosnia, Herzegovina, Egypt, Israel, Jordan, Lebanon, Mauritania, Monaco, Montenegro, Morocco, Palestine, Syria. Uh, the participation of Syria was suspended in 2011 for the reasons which you can imagine. Uh, Tunisia, Turkey, and uh, Libya has an observer stat status in the UFM. So whenever they, they publish a call for proposal, there is a precise list of countries which can participate. Uh, I can, the, the Union for Mediterranean does not have big budgets, uh, but from time to time they publish uh, uh, some uh, call for proposals. Uh, 
And that's the reason why I, uh, I decided to show it here. Uh, the last one, which was published, which expired, uh, I think, one month ago and where we participate, it was called UFM Grant Scheme from Employment Promotion. The call is supporting non-profit organization in the Mediterranean area that work to give people opportunities in view of the COVID-19 induced economic crisis. Projects uh, should enable people to find jobs continue to gain a living and improve their work and their living conditions. At the same time, we seek to support projects that encourage entrepreneurship and improve the business climate for micro, small and medium-based enterprises as crucial providers on employment in the Mediterranean regions. And for instance, the project where we have been partner was led, was coordinated by a Palestinian university together with other universities from Palestine, from Lebanon, from Egypt, uh, with the goal to, to uh, addressing the goal of uh, encouraging part, uh, entrepreneurship and therefore setting, uh, setting up a training path for entrepreneurs and support to the creation of new enterprises uh, and this kind of things. And of course, uh, this, involve, this could involve uh, members of uh, vulnerable groups. Any questions about what I've said up to now? Uh, Raniero, just maybe a kind of a reminder. Uh, I'm sure you, you, you're you aware of it, but I, I would like to position it where it stands. There's Anna Lindt Foundation. Yeah. The Anna Lindt Foundation, yes, I didn't mention it. <laughs> It's, it was not possible to, to mention all of them. Anani Foundation is a foundation which is based in, uh, in Alexandria, in Egypt. We have uh, quite good relationships with them. Uh, I didn't uh, uh, I didn't mention here, it here because it normally doesn't fund gr uh, big projects. Uh, there are some small cases where uh, they can fund small actions, but here we were talking about funding instruments. Okay. Uh, Annaline Foundation is, is mainly concentrated on intercultural dialogue and they provide studies, uh, researches, but they normally do it internally or they can uh, outsource small bits, bits of work uh, 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 that they give uh, outside uh, of them. Anyway, thank you Nezi for <laughs> reminding me. Uh, any, other, any other comments about what I've been saying? Was everything clear? Now, of course, I'm going very fast. For each one of these programs, we could spend a couple of days illustrating the procedures, how to write a proposal, what are the mechanisms, etc. That's not the idea. This is just to let you know. And, and in two cases, which are Horizon 2020 and Erasmus Plus, we don't have the information at the moment because the new programs have not uh, been published yet. But uh, as I said, it's, it's to raise your attention and to give you the basic, basic information. So any other questions? No. If not, I'll quickly go to the last point. Examples of local programs. Now, local programs, as the name said, says, are, are run by public authorities, uh, which can be a central or local level. It can be ministries, or it can be your region, or it can be some other local, local uh, uh, authorities. Uh, but by definition, as the name says, this has a very, very strong national uh, uh, connotation. For instance, uh, in, the, in the European Union member states, most of the, these projects are funded by uh, European programs, what is called indirect funds, or better known as structural funds. Structural funds are European programs which send money not to the individual participants, like in our case, they send it to the, to the, for instance, regional authorities or national authorities, which then publish call for proposals. Uh, in non-European countries, they can be funded through national funds or even through uh, Europe aid. Uh, but of course, they are very much differentiated uh, on, a national, on a country by country and, and even, I would say, region by region basis. So it's not possible. I cannot know what happens in Hungary, what happens in Finland, or what happens in Turkey. 
uh, what the only thing I can do is give you a small example of what happens in Italy, for instance. Ah, one thing, uh, one important thing I want to mention is that in many countries, AMIF, the one we have we have seen where we have got the the safe project, also has national funds. Works also at national level. For instance, in Italy, the Ministry for Interior uh, used now it's over now, but it used to 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 publish calls for proposals, national Italian calls for uh, funded through the AMIF fund. So you should check if in your country the AMIF fund is 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 funding projects at the local level. Uh, Rome, as you know, is in the Lazio region, and uh, uh, now, of course, this is <laughs> this is in Italian, but I can translate it. This is an open call for proposal. It's small projects, it's fifty thousand euros. It's uh, uh, what um, what they call inclusive communities, two thousand twenty, and it's a call for proposal in the area of social services. So it's uh, it's. Uh, aims at implementation, implementing uh, local uh, networks of the third sector uh, to bring out uh, the needs of the individual territories uh, and again uh, to take out best practices, which means experiences which have uh, excellent results and to transfer it to other, uh, to other results. Uh, so, um, the amount of money is very small, it's six, six and a half million, but as, you, as I said, the projects are also very small. It's up to, to uh, 50,000 euros, so they can fund uh, quite a quite high number of, uh, of projects. And, uh, and as I said, this is simply uh, an example of what happens in, in, in my region in Italy. So you have to specialize to look for funds at your regional level. So I'm afraid we've reached the end of the uh, of the webinar. I can uh, do a short recap. Uh, we have analyzed the Horizon 2020, the Erasmus Plus, both in terms of strategic partnerships and capacity building for higher education, uh, the AMI Fund, Europe Aid. Uh, we had a quick glance at the Union for the Mediterranean, and we had some examples of local programs. So the uh, uh, main conclusion is that there are many opportunities but none of them is easy to get. Public funding is not an ATM where you can put your card and get money out of it. There is a lot of work, there is a very high selection, so you must be always very, very careful about the quality of what you are uh, submitting and uh, above all, uh, how much it corresponds to the terms of reference to the call for proposal, how it fits into what the commission is looking for. So uh, another important thing is that it is not, uh, you know, uh, take the money and run. It is, uh, you need a structured and continuous monitoring activity to identify viable solution. And you don't have to get discouraged if you don't manage to get through the first uh, attempt. And also, because we are, we are, for instance, Unimed is a network, but also the partnership of uh, the RACE project is a network. Uh, partnership is also very important. So try to find uh, the best partners for, uh, for your project in order to set up a strong partnership which can respond to the needs of the, uh, of the call for proposal. So this is more or less, uh, oh yes. So um, this is more or less what I wanted to say. If there are any questions, we, have, we still have a few minutes to discuss. Or if you want to add something to what I've said, Luisa, maybe with your wide, wide experience in this kind of programs, you might add some experiences or, or things that I didn't. Uh, no, the uh, the only uh, ones that we were talking also about projects that involve mainly higher education institutions. Um, what is, according to 
uh, my understanding uh, the horizon of the Erasmus Plus program, which are the knowledge alliances. Uh, which is the only key action that allows research and Erasmus Plus. And as you mentioned, uh, for research, we have a specific program, which will be the new Euro Europe Horizon, Horizon Europe. Um, and this was just another thing that I thought, oh, this is missing on the list, the knowledge alliances. Yes, there is one. There are two specific reasons why I didn't mention knowledge alliances, Luisa. The first one is because uh, I don't think that Unimed has never participated in one of them. Is that right, Christina? Are you aware if we did any? No, it no. has very few also um, uh, uh, approved uh, yearly. The other reason. That's why I said it's kind of prestige of the Erasmus Plus because there are so little uh, number of projects approved. Uh, that, that, so that, it's a bit. Um, that's the second reason why I didn't mention it. <laughs> I always remember a, uh, a slide which was produced by the European Commission at the beginning of the Erasmus Plus 2014-2020 program, which showed the number of projects which would be uh, approved in each category. And for knowledge alliances, it was 150 projects over seven years for the whole of Europe, which means 20 projects per year. Yes, it's very... <laughs> So I said I'll never run for one of these because <laughs> I think strategic partnership, the number was 25,000, something like that. So I was among the, the lucky ones then. I had the pleasure to work on one. It's not luck. It's, uh, it means that you're, you were absolutely <laughs> excellent in writing the proposal. Yeah, but it's, I mean, that I personally could have the pleasure to experience it. Uh, yeah, that's, that's luck. That the organization has the competence to do it, so great. But I, I, I mean, it was great, great experience. Do you want to say us to tell us a couple of words about this project in knowledge alliances? It was about uh, PhD STEM students mm -hmm. um, and how to create their own startups. So we had some um, business competition, business idea competitions, business angels. It was a big effort, but. Uh, it was enjoyable for both parts, for the, the scientists, with the young scientists uh, proposing their brilliant ideas, and for us, guiding the process was great. Okay, thank you very much for this input. And yes, you have been uh, lucky, but also very, very good and competent in writing such, in winning such a competitive uh, call. Uh, there, there were also another time which was called uh, uh, one was alliance uh, and the other is sector skills alliance sector skills alliance yeah it was about the same uh, yes uh, these are the two yeah the same cam. of, of, of <laughs> process uh, and 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 when what i always say is when uh, you you analyze a new call for proposals and in order to decide whether it's worth participating or not, one of the criteria is to see how many projects will be approved, will be selected. This is a, something that you can understand from the, from the beginning. And if you see that, for instance, in Horizon 2020, there are in some cases, they only fund one project per call. So this is a call for tender, basically, it's not a call for proposal. And you must, uh, uh, you know, analyze very, very deeply whether it is worth running in such a competitive, a competitive uh, uh, context. Yeah. So, if there are no other comments, I would like to thank all of you. Thank Christina for the support, and thank you all. And uh, and uh, for those who celebrated a Merry Christmas, and for everybody, Happy New Years. And thanks to Unimed and Raniel for the patience for leading our, um, let's say, plenary classroom. Thank you very much. Thank you, Raniero. <laughs> a real pleasure. It's been it was a long journey this week, and it was absolutely lovely. Thank you, Raniero. Thank you, Christine. Thank, Thank you. you so much, Raniero. Thank you. Bye-bye.